doing well. Um, this uh, is a webinar. Again, I'm not able to see you. Uh, I miss seeing you guys in class and having that interactive uh, uh, answering question sessions uh, that I, I actually missed that quite a bit. Uh, in that, uh, in this webinar format, uh, it's just like one way I see the camera and I don't see any of you guys. Uh, I hope you guys can hear me okay. Uh, you got any questions, uh, use the uh, control uh, button. Uh, Laura is there to uh, help uh, facility um, uh, bring up the questions. Okay, uh, let's, let's get started. Um, today, we're going to focus on um, contract issues. Um, more so on maybe perhaps less common uh, contract issues. Now, uh, in this particular um, time during the pandemic, uh, the, the California Association had instituted a number of forms, uh, eight forms, um, listing, selling, uh, plus some rental forms. Uh, there are a number of webinars out there uh, regarding these forms, so I'm not going to touch uh, all of them. So I do want to bring um, certain things regarding a couple forms to your attention. The main one is the, um, the CBA form, the Coronavirus Addendum Amendment. Um, you should be able to see that on your screen. I'm sharing the screen. Um, this form has been updated. This is the April 16 version. Okay, I have received an offer um, earlier this month with the older version. I'm looking at another screen. I got four screens on my uh, desk. Um, that version is the uh, March um, 20th version. Okay, this version. Uh, I will show you the difference of those two, um, mainly uh, the more important things that you should be aware of. On this particular form, when are you going to use it? Is this mandatory? Okay, these forms are not mandatory. Okay, you can use them or you, you don't have to use them. Okay, if you use this, this particular form right here, the, Cal, uh, the uh, coronavirus addendum or amendment, it should be used in conjunction uh, with another form called NUCC. Okay, I'll bring that form over briefly. Okay, that's a notice of unforeseen coronavirus circumstances. Okay, let me go over um, this main form first. Okay, this is to be used with an offer or as a counter offer. Now, if this is going to be used with an offer, you need to submit this form together with your RPA if you're using an RPA or an RIPA. Okay, now if you submitted an RPA, got that accepted already, okay, this is going to be a separate form you're going to be using if you want to use it at all. Uh, one other topic I want to cover today <clears throat> is called a parole evidence rule. Okay, we'll cover that uh, in, a, in a little bit uh, later. Okay, on this form, okay, it sets to be used with an offer or counter offer or as a uh, amendment after acceptance. Okay, when you have an offer that been accepted, those terms are binding. It's not open to a unilateral like, like changes. Okay, so uh, it will require mutual consent. Okay, uh, if the other party does not want to agree to the terms in this particular amendment addendum, this addendum is no good, okay? Look down here. It says, or have a checkbox. If you check this, this is an uh, amendment to an already accepted um, uh, agreement. So you, you had an accepted RPA and you forgot to use this, or you want to use this form to modify the terms of the RPA, check this box right here, okay? Then the following saying, this amendment shall be deemed revoked unless within three days or number of days you prescribe after being signed by the uh, in, uh, initiating party, uh, it is signed by the other party. That means you submit this, this offer, it got accepted already. And then you wanna modify the terms of the initial offer because of the coronavirus situation. Then you add this form, but the other side doesn't have to agree to any changes that you propose using this particular CBA form, okay? Just be aware. If you're gonna use this form, I would recommend submitting it together with the RPA or RIPA, 
submitted with your 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 offer uh, or or CPA uh, commercial purchase agreement. Okay, if you're gonna use it later on, the other side does not have the affirmative obligation to accept this form or its terms included therein. Okay, now let's scroll down to the uh, to the bottom. What does this form do? This form primarily do two things. One, it does the extension of time, okay, uh, to remove contingencies. The second is to extend the time for escrow closing, okay. Uh, section 4A is an extension of time. Now, this forms have a checkbox here, have a checkbox down here also, A and B. First checkbox, extension of time to remove contingency. It sets the time to remove the following contingencies provided they have not already been waived or removed, okay? Default date is 30 days, or you can prescribe the number of days after delivery of the NUCC form. So if you use this, you need to bring that notice of unforeseen coronavirus circumstances form, the NUCC form. We go over that form in a little bit, okay? Uh, I'll bring over another document here. This is the same form. Okay, this is the, um, the, the CBA form, but this is the March 20th version. Now, I have a listing uh, that I received an offer that was uh, submitted along with this form. However, in section four, an extension of time, the form is a little different. It says the time to remove the following contingencies shall be extended for 30 days. And they give you these check boxes. The agent that submit the offer did not, let me bring Christ's name, did not check any of these boxes. <laughs> Meaning what? That means none of these contingencies is gonna get extended, okay? Extension of time for buyer to remove contingency. Again, the time to remove the following contingency shall be extended for 30 days colon for which one if you didn't check any of these none of these going to get extended so i think carl uh, recognized a mistake so they revised the form so make sure you use the newest version of the form i know uh, i know um uh, the different offices uh including my new office have uh, circulated uh, the new form uh and the old form previously so make sure if you download the form in your hard drive or you're gonna use it, uh, 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 use a SIP form. The SIP form have the most updated form. Make sure you use it, the most updated form, okay? The new forms is a little bit different. It says the time to remove the following contingencies, provided they have not already been waived or removed, shall be extended to 30 days, okay? All contingencies, okay? The default is to extend that 30 days default time to all contingencies instead of the old form where you have to check the boxes, okay? If you want to remove a particular or a number of uh, contingencies only, but not all, then you follow on and say, if check only, then you check loan, um, investigation, uh, this inspection, appraisal, you can check the boxes accordingly, okay? So make sure you have the newest form. If you use the old form, make sure you check the boxes that's appropriate. The new form, if you don't check any boxes, it will apply to all contingencies, okay? And also the NBP, the notice to buy, uh, to perform, okay? It's not required before um, the um, uh, issue, issuance of uh, escrow cancellation, okay? It says here, um, form NBP, as otherwise applicable, shall not by default, you can make it, you can check it here, but by default it says not, be required before seller may issue a CC, okay? Cancellation of contract. Now, the second section, section B, is extension of time for escrow, okay? Default, 30 days, okay? I received the offer for asking for 30 days extension for uh, uh, contingency and escrow. So I counter them to limit the uh, extension of contingency to 15 days. And also for close up escrow, uh, for no more than 15 days. So you can change that default 30 days into 15 days. Also, you need to deliver that uh, NUCC form right here, okay? Now, demand to close escrow, DCE, shall not 
be required. That's by default, okay, if you want to cancel. And also, uh, this particular form has section five here for mutual cancellation. Um, using this form is sufficient to cancel escrow because this form says, this form CBA shall constitute irrevocable joint uh, instructions to escrow holder to cancel escrow, okay? without further instructions to part, uh, for parties. Now, it depends on your escrow, unless it's necess necessary to satisfy escrow holders' regulatory requirement. Some escrow might still require you to have another form to cancel escrow, but this is a new form with a provision uh, for mutual cancellation. And this form stated here that this form alone is sufficient. But again, check with your particular escrow to see if this form alone will be sufficient. If not, you might need to have the another cancellation document. Now, the uh, other document. Now, this form obviously is of advantageous to the um, uh, buyer. Uh, my listing was canceled, um, uh, the, the, the transaction was canceled because after the agent submitted an offer about two weeks into escrow, uh, the buyer lost his job due to COVID-19. Now, if we have a 30 days extension of escrow, another 30 days extension of removal contingency, so we, have, we would have up to 60 day period for, for um, escrow closing. Now, the buyer can basically string you along and not let you know if he lost his job. Does he lost his job during the second week, but he's waiting to see if his company can get some sort of government financing a government loan, uh, the business might reopen, might we will hire him again, but he's waiting for another several weeks without knowing. And at the end of the several weeks, which may be the six or seven weeks into escrow, then you come back and tell the seller, I'm sorry, uh, due to COVID-19, I lost my job, I can't qualify, I have to cancel. Here's a CBA form that, um, that you have signed earlier that entitled me to get out of escrow. The seller all this time being string along, and not able to sell his property. So obviously it's a disadvantage to the seller. Okay, so let's look at the other form. Okay, the notice of unforeseen circumstances. Let me maximize this. Okay. Um, this is going to be used together with the CBA form or this notice being provided for information purpose only, not directly tied to any agreement. So uh, I would use this as part of your purchase agreement uh, disclosure. This is for extension of time or mutual cancellation. But look down here. I would, I would counter um, the, uh, the uh, agent submitting the offer with these type of forms because to protect the, to the seller, your client, um, for unlimited amount of time up to 60 days, okay, uh, if you can have the option that the seller, based on COVID-19, can unilaterally cancel just as the buyer can, that makes it more fair to both parties. So, in this form, there are sections here. The um, COVID-19 could result from, uh, could affect different areas. So I will put like maybe movers uh, and others, I say arranging accommodations, transportations, flights, storage, visa, obtaining medication or medical care. Now my current seller, um, he is planning to move uh, with his family and relocate to uh, South Korea. Uh, he's a retired postal worker. So if a particular buyer uh, submitted an offer with this addendum, uh, uh, CBA to extend up to another 30 days. So the seller, if he can find a better offer, uh, maybe a cash offer with an offer not have this particular extension uh, of time requirement or have certain things waived in the beginning. So that seller might possibly, um, using some of these reasons, uh, 
able to unilaterally cancel the agreement just as a buyer can. Okay. Um, now the problem of these forms are they are not mandatory. They are not required. Second, are they going to be self-certified of the COVID-19 condition? It doesn't say clearly in these forms uh, what documents or what evidence must be provided to the other party in order to cancel. Okay, so uh, I cover in the uh, 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 last uh, my last webinar regarding um, the, the new laws about tenants uh, eviction protection for non-payment of rent. Um, the Los Angeles City Council come down with a new order, uh, I think only about a week or so ago, um, that sets um, tenants um, uh, situation uh, where the particular tenants affected by COVID-19 can self-certify, okay? And the landlord must accept that self-certification by tenant as sufficient. Meaning what? Anybody can claim anything without proof. If I claim that and I certify that as the problem, you have to believe me. That's what it said. So in this particular call form, is this required? From what I read so far, it's not required, it's not mandatory. And there's no uh, evidence that need to be submitted as concrete proof in order to effect any of these uh, 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 cancellations, okay? That's as, uh, as far as I wanna go for this particular uh, uh, two forms. So just beware, these documents are not mandatory. And if you're gonna use them, uh, make sure you check the appropriate boxes, okay? Now, um, since this is an addendum that can be provided or some agent might provide it uh, after the uh, initial agreement have been signed. So uh, again, I talked about earlier about um, one of the contract uh, issues is about um, parole evidence. Uh, what does that mean? For example, if in an MLS uh, in your listing, the seller tell you that the barbecue is going to be included. Okay, it states in the uh, MLS clearly, and the buyer have printed a copy and have evidence uh, of that inclusion. So, at the end of uh, escrow, uh, when a buyer takes possession, they found the the uh, barbecue is not there anymore, and they ask the agent. The agent went back and asked the listing agent and, and the seller. They say, "Hey, um, I didn't agree to giving you that barbecue." It was not in the original contract, okay? In the purchase agreement, RPA. The buyer said, when we came to your house, I was holding this particular ML sheet that my agent provided me. It says a barbecue is included. At that time, you were there, the seller. Your agent were there, the listing agent. My agent was there, the selling agent. And myself is there, the buyer. All four party was there, and all four party heard you said in an incontrovertible manner that the barbecue is to be included. Now, legally, is a barbecue going to be included? Even that is advertised in writing in the MLS itself? No, it is not. Why not? The MLS. It's not a contractual agreement. The RPA is the contractual agreement. The purchase agreement is, a, is the official agreement. Who are the parties? The buyer and the seller exclusively and not the agents. The agents are governed by MLS rules. You cannot make a willful misrepresentation. If this is not true, you should not include the barbecue to be included. But if the client, if the seller told you the barbecue is to be included, you so put it in their MLS and advertise it, that is not a willful misrepresentation. A matter of fact, it's not a misrepresentation at all. At the end, it was not included because either the agent dropped the ball and not wrote the uh, barbecue to be included in the purchase agreement, or the seller changes mind and not want to give up 
the barbecue. And therefore, he, he told his agent not to uh, include that. If the selling side didn't include a barbecue in the beginning, okay, and the seller and the buyer came to terms, that barbecue is not included. Okay. Regarding this particular form, same thing. If you use this CA, CVA form subsequent after the acceptance of the offer, this can all only be used as a request. Can we extend escrow for another 30 days? May we extend the loan contingency for another 15 or 30 days? May we extend the inspection period for longer because the inspector can get out there and, uh, and uh, the appraiser may not get out there in time because of COVID-19 situation. That can be, uh, this form can only be considered uh, as a request only. The other side that is um, already accepted your offer, um, do not have to accept uh, uh, any of these terms of proposed. Okay, so what is, what is the parole evidence rule? When you uh, study for your license test, uh, you probably have studied parole evidence rule. Parole evidence rule sets uh, in the California uh, uh, Civil Procedure, I think it's section 1856, it sets the, um, the terms uh, uh, are set forth in the writing, intended by the parties as a final expression of their agreement. We got, we got any terms uh, uh, included therein may not be contradicted by a prior agreement or any other ev evidence, okay? Um, also in the California Civil Code section uh, 1825, 1826, it says, the execution of a contract in writing, whether the law requires it to be written or not, okay, supersedes all this negotiation and stipulations concerning this matter, which preceded or accompanied the execution of the instrument. What does that mean? That means if the buyer and the seller have reduced the terms of the agreement in a piece of paper, in a writing, okay? After that, even if you have a voice recording, you have another piece of paper um, documenting um, certain terms, okay? Those evidence, even though it may appear to be valid, are not to be considered as valid evidence. They are inadmissible because of parole evidence rule. Okay, again, the parole evidence rule says terms set forth in a writing intended by the parties as a final expression of the agreement may not be contradicted by a prior agreement, by a separate agreement, okay? or any other oral contemporaneous agreement. Okay, so um, let me bring this over. You can see the terms here. Okay, this is the parole evidence rule. Terms set forth in the writing intended by the parties as a final expression of the agreement with respect to the terms included therein may not be contradicted, contradicted by evidence of a prior agreement or of a contemporaneous oral agreement. So. In, in English, what this means is that once parties to your contract agree and sign to the terms of the contract, the pro evidence rule will keep the parties to the signed agreement in writing from trying to submit prior oral or written statement to modify or contradict the terms or clauses in the contract. So today I'm, I'm going to go over a number of um, clauses and uh, contract, uh, uh, useful contract, contractual clauses with you. Uh, uh, normally I don't print this out, <clears throat> but I, I, I share this with you today um, because I'm not a licensed attorney. Uh, I don't want to be construed as practicing law. So when I draft these uh, clauses, but I think um, in, in the practice of real estate, uh, I find a lot of situations where the contractual agreement itself whether it's RPA, RIPA, CPA, or any of the commercial forms, air forms, or the um, car rent rental leasing agreement, or any other rental leasing agreement in there. Um, I haven't found a single uh, contractual agreement that have um, all the ingredients, all the important things that, that I think it's, uh, uh, it's needed. So especially, um, I do property management, uh, have my own property, 
uh, I drafted a large of clauses in there, uh, narrowly drafted as to protect the landlord. So now in, I first gonna go over some of these clauses in, um, in real estate transactions, in sales and purchase, in list, listings also. Now, um, before I bring this over, <coughs> oh, uh, I'll hide this first, I'll give you a scenario. Um, an agent submits an offer, a buyer submits an offer, okay, with certain uh, amount of deposit. Let's say the deposit is $25,000, okay, uh, 3% or whatever uh, purchase price. Um, the, typically in your RPA, in the deposit section, uh, it says uh, either the, the, the buyer has submitted a, a personal check uh, to the agent uh, or the buyer is going to wire the earnest money directly into escrow. Within how many days? In the RPA, the default is three business days. Let's say your offer was sent in on Tuesday. The seller reviewed it, accepted it on Tuesday, signed it with the day on Tuesday. But the agent, the listing agent, does not forward that um, signed RPA to the selling agent until the next day, which is the uh, Wednesday. So Wednesday is the delivery day. So when the state three business day starts, the next day is Thursday. Second day is Friday. The third business day will be a Monday if that's not a public holiday or court holiday holiday. What happens if the buyer does not deposit the EMD by end of Monday? You send them a NBP and notice the buyer to perform. The, the day you send it out, let's say you send it out right away after uh, 5 p.m. On, uh, on Monday uh, because no more wire can be accepted in the afternoon after that. Uh, so you send it out, Monday itself cannot be counted. So Tuesday is the first day, Wednesday is the second day, MPP will give buyer two more days to perform. So at the end of Wednesday, if the buyer still have not tendered the, the DMD, what do you do? You can issue the escrow cancellation. Escrow cancellation will require both parties to sign. Okay, that will tie up the property for some time. If you have other offers, if you have a hot property, you got multiple offers. Some of those offers might go away in a few days. Okay, so I have this particular uh, 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 clause that I drafted. You got an earnest money deposit. It says earnest money deposit must be good and clear the funds to be deposited with escrow holder within three business day, or you can prescribe any number of business day. I, I could prescribe one business day, which I had before, okay? After acceptance, to constitute a valid, complete, binding, and enforceable purchase agreement. Again, Earnest money deposit must be good and clear the funds to be deposited with the escrow holder within X number of business days after acceptance to constitute a binding, valid, complete, and an enforceable purchase agreement. If the buyer did not deposit as agreed, that is legally no contract. Now, in the practice uh, of uh, in our industry, um, somebody insists, oh, you still need to send cancellation, and escrow may still need to do this and that. Perhaps that might be true. But which law supersedes the land? The real estate contract, escrow practices, escrow requirement, your own office requirement, or the law of the land? I think the law of the land will supersede any other uh, rules and regulations uh, by any association offices or, or escrow companies. So if this is a legal effective binding purchase agreement or the lack of it, if this is not a legal document, basically you have no contract. When you have no contract, can you immediately accept a backup or alternate offer? In my opinion, yes. And I would also, after the third business day, if you haven't deposited, I will tell you, hey, you're out. Okay, we don't have any agreement. I can accept a backup buyer and I can put him in escrow. Now, um, your particular escrow that's open currently 
might not let you open an escrow there, okay? Um, maybe another escrow company will let you do that. And I have a separate, uh, before I have a transaction like that, uh, sub, I open escrow with a separate company, uh, finally we close the transaction, okay? Next, <clears throat> in a tech, um, tech some of you, most of you should know what that is, a tenant estoppel certificate, okay? In an investment property, so when, when, when your client is, when you're representing an investor, purchasing a property, regardless it's a single family home, duplex, fourplex, multifamily building, okay? Do not use the RPA, okay? Use the RIPA. Instead of the residential purchase agreement, use the residential income purchase agreement. Why? Because the RIPA have a default checkbox that you can check and always check that, that checkbox is the TEC, the Tenant's Extapo Certificate. What is a Tenant Extapo Certificate? The Tenant's Extapo Certificate is a form. The tenant have to fill out, who are you? What is your identity? What is the address uh, of the place that you're leasing? Uh, what are the terms uh, of the lease? Uh, how much is the rent? How much security deposit um, is, have you tended to the landlord? The tenant have to sign that and the seller have to sign that, okay? That verifies um, this is the tenant and how much rent is paying. So if you're in, uh, in a situation where you, your client is acquiring a eight unit apartment building, a multifamily building or a larger, or even a four unit, okay? You need to go serve the tenant this tech form. Now, who do you think is going to be serving that form? The seller or do you think the listing agent? Obviously, the seller is going to want the listing agent to help circulate that form instead of the seller going down to the property. When you go to the property, the tenant might not be there. You call ahead, tenant told you that he's going to be there at 2 o'clock on Saturday afternoon. Do you think every single tenant make an appointment where you're going to show up on time and going to be there to sign that tech form? No. So using that form is an advantage uh, for your client if he's a buyer requiring the tech. It's a disadvantage to the seller because the seller have to go around and try to secure that form from the tenant. Also, even if the tenant is available, keeps the schedule, okay, he's gonna be home. He might be unwilling to sign the form. Some tenants are less than cooperative. So it, it would be an issue getting every single tenant uh, willing to complete and sign that form. So to defeat that, I will use a clause in there. Let's say, uh, if, if buyer and, <clears throat> look at this, look at the clause here. If buyer and selling agent requires to tech form the tenant example certificate, make a counter offer, SCO, SMCO. Seller to provide all available lease copies and a certified rent roll to buyer in lieu of the tenant estoppel certificate, okay? Meaning what? Meaning, okay, instead of giving you a tenant uh, estoppel, I'm gonna give you a rent roll. A rent roll is just a list of uh, the units. Uh, apartment A is rent this much, apartment B is rent this, that's a, that's a rent roll, okay? Instead of giving you a, t a tech, I'm gonna give you a certified rent roll. What does a certified rent roll mean? Basically a rent roll signed by the, uh, signed by the seller, it, that, that constitutes a certified rent roll. It doesn't need to be notarized. Okay, and a, um, uh, a copy and all the lease copies uh, of, of the uh, uh, lease agreement. Now, focus on this word. I'll use the word available lease copies. Some, uh, some landlords or seller have acquired a property a long time ago, and the tenants, some tenants have been there a long time. I have one tenant myself, have lived there for over 20 some years. When the building was acquired more than 10 years ago, he was there already. We didn't have some of these uh, original uh, uh, lease agreement. Now, if you are a landlord uh, that, is, uh, that, is, that is really on top of things, you would have executed a new lease agreement with the tenant when you move in, okay? If, if the uh, existing tenant's lease have not expired yet, okay? But just for those landlords um, that do not have a, a, a new uh, lease in place, and with tenant that have been there for a long time, and the previous seller did not uh, supply you a copy of the lease agreement, make sure in the clause, you say, seller to provide all available lease copies, okay? If the buyer accepts that, hey, that constitutes sufficient 
uh, performance. Okay. Next, in a 1031 tax deferred exchange, before I bring that up. Now, um, some of you might not have done a 1031 before. Um, I'm in the process of um, writing a 1031 tax deferred exchange book. Uh, this coronavirus thing is, is, is most uh, uh, convenient time. Uh, I finished 18 chapters already. In a 1031 exchange, this unextendable timeline, you have a 45 day property identification period and you have 180 days uh, escrow closing period uh, or that is the shorter of the 180 days or the federal tax filing due date. So if your transaction gravitate to what the end of the year, like after October 16, October 17, you do not have the full 180 days because the, um, the tax due date is April 15. From January 1st, April 15 is three and a half months. So if your, if your escrow opens, yeah, let's say December 31st, end of the year, until tax due date, three and a half months, that's only 100, 105 days, okay? Uh, if you don't file an extension, that's how much time you're gonna have, it's about 480 days, okay? So for an exchange client, make sure um, you uh, advise a client to extend um, your tax filing, even though the tenant, uh, the, the client's ready to file uh, for their returns. Do not file until you complete uh, your 1031 exchange transaction. Now, since these deadlines are non-extendable, okay, uh, wouldn't it be nice if we can stretch this time somewhere, okay? The 45 day and the 180 day uh, identification and closing period starts from the day after the relinquished property has been transferred, meaning the property is gonna be sold, uh, the escrow has closed. The very next day is the first day. Now, when you start looking for replacement property, not after close of escrow, and in my opinion, not before you open escrow either. Why? Because in a 1031 exchange, the purchase funds is gonna be coming out from the equity of the relinquished property. If your relinquished property, the property you're gonna sell, is not even in escrow, you think the buyer is gonna accept your offer? Of course not. So start looking at properties immediately after the relinquished property is, is under contract in escrow. Escrow and give you a net sheet, you can use it as proof of funds uh, to show the, uh, the property buyer uh, that you wanna uh, acquire the property uh, uh, proof of funds. Okay, so if the typical escrow is 30 days, okay, if I represent the seller, I'm the listing agent, okay, uh, I mean, I represent the buyer, the buying agent, uh, the selling agent. So I would include this, okay? Buyer, uh, it depends on your seller or buyer, okay? If you're the seller, then you say, buyer to cooperate with sellers 1031, um, the tax deferred exchange at no cost to buyer. The key part here in the whole clause here is just these two words. Including reasonable extensions of escrow to complete the seller's exchange. Buyer to execute all escrow instructions, exchange and assignment documents, agreements and instructions reasonably requested by the seller. Buyer to incur no additional costs, expenses, obligations, or liabilities as a result of or connected with the seller's 1031 tax deferred exchange. Okay, so again, the key word is reasonable ex uh, uh, extension of escrow. What constitutes reasonable extension? Is three days reasonable? Is one week reasonable? Two weeks, three weeks? Okay. It will depend on the circumstances. If a exchanger or buyer in a 1031 exchange has diligently go out and look for replacement property, but each time the replacement property after the inspection, there's substantial defects, therefore the buyer do not wish to proceed with that particular property, and the buyer have to go out look for new property, new to identify new properties again. I would think that could constitute a reasonable uh, delay. And uh, so, if the other party is willing to accept your counter to include this particular clause to include a reasonable extension, it will be to your benefit, even if you don't need it. On the other side, if you represent the seller now, okay, you don't want the seller to be tied it up. Okay, uh, I was involved in a, a nine unit uh, multifamily in uh, San Bernardino. 
uh, that was owned by an agent from my old office. And that seller, that agent told me that, uh, 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 I, I, if I don't find a replacement property, I won't sell. But the buyer himself, he is also doing an exchange. And he sold a, a, pro, a commercial property for $4 million. He bought several smaller property. He has another $700,000 cap space. If he doesn't use that, that $700,000 will be considered as a boot. Uh, for you guys that know about 1031, boot is a taxable uh, event. Uh, the $700,000 unused equity uh, will be taxable. So he didn't want to have that park tax. tax. So he wanted to use that up. So he leveraged in getting a loan to buy this uh, $1.2 uh, uh, $1 million property. But the seller says, if I don't find a replacement property, I'm not going to sell. The buyer now is under the clock because his 45-day identification period is ending. So if the seller end up not selling, the buyer would have passed at that line and not able to do an exchange. So what do you do? What I did is I counted the seller. Okay, yes, we can, we'll include reasonable extension, but uh, that's up to maybe 60 days or 90 days. Okay, so uh, if you are representing the seller, make sure if the other side is using this particular clause, either you got it from me or you heard it from my class or now, okay, make sure you counter that and cap that uh, with a certain number of weeks or a certain number of days. Okay, next one, uh, service provider advisory. Now, what, what, what is a service provider advisory? Okay, if you're a real estate agent, you recommend a service provider, like a termite company or, or a, uh, a lender or a uh, 1031 or a QI, a qualified intermediary. If something happened, something goes south, that lender, that inspector, that appraiser, whoever, that, that qualified intermediary and vessel your funds or cause some problems. If you recommend that service provider, who do you think the buyer or the client's gonna sue? Okay. So I have included this clause in here, say buyer or seller. It's advice that real estate salesperson and brokers do not endorse and are prohibited from referring and recommending any service providers, including but not limited to lenders, escrow, exchange accommodators, home inspectors, termite companies, contractors, or any other service providers or vendors. Buyer or leasee, meaning tenant, to use due diligence and prudence in investigating and selecting buyer's own service provider or vendors to be used in the buyer's own purchase transaction. This is particularly important. Agents do not, do not, do not, under no circumstances would you recommend a qualified intermediary in an exchange transaction, okay? I cannot stress that more. A qualified intermediary is called QI or commonly called exchange accommodator or exchange facilitator is needed and is required by the IRS, okay, in a 1031 exchange. A, an exchanger cannot receive the sales proceed even when escrow is closed, okay. If the exchange actually received the sale proceed is considered an actual proceed or constructive receipt of money, which will be taxable and the exchange will be disallowed. The money have to go to the QI, the qualified intermediary. Qualified intermediaries, uh, if you guys have attended my 1031 class before, uh, which I have one coming up actually uh, 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 next month, uh, the qualified intermediary uh, are not fairly regulated. Okay, um, there are there are lots of negatives about qualified intermediaries. One thing. Most important thing is about your exchange fund, your client's money. Okay, when it goes from escrow to a qualified intermediary, okay, the funds is gonna sit in the qualified intermediary's trust account. Oftentimes, that funds will be invested in some other investment vehicles. Okay, even if that money is not invested in any investment vehicle subject to losses. Okay, that money is just sitting in the account. The account might be FDIC protected. And I personally contacted the uh, FDIC. I called him on the phone. I said, is your limit is still $250,000 per account? The answer is absolutely and definitively yes. And then I asked, do you have any other account structure that can be protected by FDIC 
that are some sort of trust account where funds in in much more access than two hundred fifty thousand dollars, because in an exchange company, uh, one transaction alone, the sales proceed could exceed far exceed two hundred fifty thousand dollars. It could be half a million, quarter million, or million dollars in sales proceeds sitting in the QI's uh, trust account from one client only. If this is a sizable company, exchange company, he could have fifty. Hundred or more than hundred transaction going on at transaction going on at the same time. Imagine you have fifty, seventy million dollars sitting in an account, and only two hundred fifty thousand dollars is protected. Basically, your money is not protected at all, right? If there's an embezzlement, it's a misappropriation of funds. That's a theft, and as a result, the client loses the money, and you recommended that. Qualify intermediary, you're gonna be in deep trouble. But then, how is a tenant gonna able to do the transaction if you cannot recommend a service provider? I do it this way. I'll email the client this particular clause that I drafted. Then I follow up and say, by the way, uh, my recent clients uh, recently have used um, this particular uh, inspector or or QI or whoever the, the service provider may be, and uh, they seem to be happy with that particular QI or service provider. Um, there are other service providers, at least two or three of those in the email, that uh, some of my clients are also uh, are happy with. Uh, but it's your responsibility uh, to investigate and to select your own service provider. And uh, we as an agent of brokers are prohibited from recommending those service providers. Okay, extremely important. Okay, um, now, uh, I don't know how many of you guys are uh, uh, brokers, uh, house brokers, or, or owners of the uh, a brokerage, um, but I'm always on the side of agents. So um, this uh, particular uh, clause that I've drafted uh, is for the protection of uh, agents. Uh, it's called Automatic Listing Agreement Termination Clause. Okay, when you sign a list agreement, um, I always include this particular clause in there most of the time anyway. It says, this residential commercial business listing agreement with exclusive authorization and right to sell is expressly contingent and conditioned upon Tony Lam or upon so and so being the sole listing agent for the property AP listed with ABC brokerage realty. This listing agreement to automatically and unconditionally terminate and cancel without any additional or further actions should so-and-so you no longer work for or be employed by ABC Realty. And seller shall be released and relieved of all liabilities with, with respect to the obligation and or covenants under this agreement and seller to own no further obligations or any compensations to ABC Realty or its assigned parties and or related entities. Okay, so a client come to you, they want to sell the house, not because of your brokerage, it's because of you, because they trust you, they experience with you, or you're highly recommended to that particular seller. It's not because the seller likes your brokerage. Okay, I would say 99% of the time uh, when a, an agent representing a client, uh, a seller, is because um, the seller likes that particular agent. And it will be unfair, not only to that agent, uh, not able to handle the client, uh, if that agent decides to uh, jump ship and uh, move to a different brokerage for whatever reasons, uh, family move, uh, illness, or whatever reason. Okay, The client himself, the seller himself, is also not fair to the seller that uh, the seller does not uh, or do not get the agent that they wanted to represent them. So uh, I, uh, after careful consideration, I have drafted this particular uh, clause. Now, it is your relationship with your broker as to the uh, permissibility uh, of using this particular clause. Uh, some of your brokers might object the inclusion of such a clause. Some of the brokers will not allow you to take the listing away. Um, have experience uh, with some uh, uh, agent that want to uh, switch to a different company and uh, we're prevented to uh, because uh, the agents don't want to lose their own listing. Okay, next. What is a default and a breach? Okay, now I'm gonna hide this for now. 
Um, we all we hear these terms all the time: a default, uh, a buyer default, a tenant default, uh, a breach. What is the difference? Okay, default is really an act. Okay, a non-performance. Okay, an act by a party, by a contractual party. A breach is the occurrence of such failure to perform. Okay, let me give you the legal definition so you have a little bit more clarity from this point forward. What is a default? What is a breach? Okay, a default, um, the legal definition is a failure by a contractual party, like the tenant, the leasee, failure to comply or perform any of the items, covenants, conditions, or rules and regulations on their, on their contractual agreement. Basically, a default is a failure to perform as agreed. Failure to perform as agreed, which is a default. Okay? A breach is the occurrence of one or more of the defaults. Okay? The breach is an event happening, an occurrence of one or more of default. And the failure of a contractual party of a leasee tenant to cure such default within an applicable grace period. Sometimes the um, uh, contract will provide or lease agreement will provide, okay, uh, within a certain number of days, if you, uh, if you kill this particular non-performance, okay, um, you will not be considered uh, as breaching the uh, contractual agreement, okay? So uh, the first failure to perform is considered a default, okay? A breach is like when you're given enough time to cure, you still don't cure, that would be a breach. Now, liquidated damage. What does liquidated damage mean? In your RPA, RIPA, and all your contractual agreement, usually it will contain a liquidated damage provision. We hear a company got liquidated. Okay, uh, what does that mean? Uh, when a company goes bankrupt, it sells all its assets. That's what the, the word liquidate means. Uh, but as to the contractual agreement in our, our, our contract, our PA, liquidated damage, it basically is a pre-agreed to amount in the event if a contractual party fails to perform. Okay, it's a predetermined amount money we talk about money okay a predetermined amount which the contractual party agrees as damages as compensation if one party defaults or fails to perform okay let's see under what conditions okay in the rpa if a buyer fails to complete this purchase because a buyer's default we already talked about what default was fail to perform and agreed as agreed Okay. If a buyer fails to complete the purchase because of buyer's default, buyer's failure to perform, okay, seller shall retain as liquidated damage the deposit actually paid. Right here in the purchase agreement, our RPA, with this liquidated damage, if both damages, if both party initials this, uh, this provision, that means they agree as to the compensation, what compensation is going to be. Okay whether it's reasonable or not. So far, if you agree to this ahead of time, that agreed amount of compensation will constitute something called, legally, it's called a liquidated damage. Okay. However, in the RPA, in the, in the real estate industry, there are some limitations. What are limitations? If the property is a dwelling, what is a dwelling? A dwelling is a place of residence where a natural person lives in it. The, the word person in law could mean something different. It could mean an individual, it could mean an entity like a partnership, LLC, a corporation. That's what a person means. But a dwelling is referred to a place of residence of a natural person. A natural person meaning an individual person, a life person and not a business entity, okay? If a property is a dwelling with no more than four units, has to be four units or less, and one of the uh, and one of which they mean that means one of the units, one of the four units, the buyer intends to occupy, then the amount retained 
uh, shall no more than 3% of the purchase price, of the purchase price, not 3% of the deposit that had been tendered, okay? Any excess shall be returned to buyer. So in other words, a buyer give you an earnest money deposit. If the buyer defaults, what are your remedies? Okay, your remedy is to take this deposit. If both the buyer and seller has in issue the RPA, the RIPA, or the CPA liquidated provision section, and if the property is a drawing, and if that property is four unit or less, and if the buyer intend to occupy one of those units, and if you can take a deposit, you can take no more than 3% of the purchase price and not the, the 3% of the earnest money deposit. Okay, so is it clear now? And I have a client, um, an investment client, and uh, he, uh, he told me one time, well, nobody ever explained to me uh, so clearly about a, a liquidated provision in a contract, even though he's a very seasoned investor. Again, what is a liquidated damage? Liquidated damages are pre-agreed to monetar monetary compensation in the event when a contractual party fails to perform, okay? And the restriction is that uh, the seller can only take that deposit money if the property to be purchased is a residential property. And that residential property has to be one or four unit and no more than four unit. And the buyer has to have the intention to occupy at least one of the units. And that amount, pre-agreed to compensation amount, has to be no more than 3% of the purchase price. Even if the ten, the, the not the tenant, the tenant, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the tenant, the, the buyer. Even the buyer have tender more than 3% as deposit. You cannot keep more than 3%. If the buyer tender less than 3% deposit, you can keep up to whatever amount, okay, if it's less than 3%, okay? Okay, I have the uh, next section. It's called loan update. Um, uh, loan update, what's a loan update clause, okay? Um, it came up to my, uh, my office meeting last year and some agents is really, really upset um, that the uh, listing agent, that the buyer's uh, agent uh, or the buyer or the buyer's loan agent are not returning their calls, not giving them a loan update. And the seller and the listing agent doesn't know what's going on in terms of the status of the buyer's loan. So uh, can you call the loan agent uh, and find out the, the status of the loan as the listing agent? You may not. Well, you can, but the loan agent is not obligated to tell you anything, okay? The loan application is between the lender and the borrower. The contractual agreement is between those two parties alone, and they have privacy uh, issues regarding disclosure disclosing any of the uh, uh, items uh, uh, within that contractual agreement of obtaining a loan. So, however, if you have one of these uh, clauses in there, what does it say? Buyer consents and buyers and buyers consents and buyers lenders to cooperate with seller and a seller's agent, which is a listing agent, in providing loan updates and loan status to seller and listing agent. So you want to inquire about the buyer's loan status, have one of these in your contractual agreement that obligates the other side to provide you with the loan update. If they don't, you can send them an NBP. And if they fail, continue to provide you any update. Can you have grounds to issue escrow cancellation if you have a, another buyer uh, uh, waiting in the wings that are more qualified and a lot more cooperative with this particular uh, uh, Long update clause that will constitute uh, a situation where you can issue an NBP failure to uh, perform, uh, which could result in determination or cancellation of the purchase agreement. Okay. Next, um, this might be a more technical one. Uh, I'm not going to cover a uh, swap and drop uh, uh, strategy in uh, tendering change lease uh, situation. Okay. 
name use prohibition. Okay, let me hide it for a little bit. What does that mean? If you're a landlord um, or you have an agent helping a client to manage properties, okay, uh, it's a toilet issue, plumbing issue, uh, but um, the tenant, without telling you the landlord or the agent, uh, went out there and get their own plumber or go own service provider for whatever problem. And then told the service provider, service provider is gonna say, how are you gonna pay for it? We'll say, uh, build a landlord. This is a landlord's name, his phone number, email address, and his address. Landlord gets stuck with a bill, unbeknown to him or her, uh, what it's that about, okay? So uh, I would put this particular clause in your leasing agreement. It says, tenant shall not at any time or any, any circumstances use the name of the landlord or landlord's business, property, plaza, mall, building, premises, or land in obtaining or making any purchases, contracts, agreements, or the engagement of any services, okay? That means the tenant uh, cannot call their own service provider. They have to um, ask you and you, the landlord, the agent, uh, go find your own service provider, okay? And next section, um, rent. Okay, um, you have a you have a client that will want to rent out a property um, that uh, you sold them, and uh, let's say rent is um, nineteen fifty. Okay, uh, the uh, California uh, last year has passed uh, Assembly Bill um, uh, fourteen eighty two uh, AB fourteen eighty two. Uh, I have a class last month for the AB fourteen eighty two. So. Basically, 1482 is called the Tenants Protection Act of 2019. In this particular Tenants Protection Act of 2019, have two particular main categories. One is eviction protection. The other one is rent increase limitation. California has become the second state in the whole United States uh, to institute a statewide rent limitation or rent control. It will limit the rent increase of no more than 5% per 12-month period, plus regional CPI increases, and the total can be no more than 10%, okay? And uh, <clears throat> in addition, there's tenants eviction protection. Uh, there's two categories. That is a just cause eviction, and that's at fault eviction protections. Just cause eviction meaning even the tenant didn't do anything wrong, the landlord may still evict them under certain, certain circumstances. Prior to January 1st, 2020, or prior to the effective date of AB 1482, uh, if a landlord uh, lease out a, a property for a particular term, let's say 12 months, at the end of the 12 months, the landlord or the property owner can take the property back without giving any particular reason. It's just like, I want a property back. Your lease term has expired, okay? I give you 60 day notice in advance to vacate and you need to leave. If you don't leave, I can evict you. Under 1482, if the tenant have lawfully and continuously uh, resided on the premises uh, for 12 months or more, the landlord may not do that any longer unless they're just causes. Just causes include if, if you or your partner or family want to move back in the property, uh, then you can uh, ask tenants to leave. Or if the property is subject to uh, like eminent domain or government forces of taking a uh, property back, or if there's can condemnation or there is issues uh, resulting from the un uh, unsafe situation, uh, like, a, like a, maybe chemical pollution, uh, nuclear release, uh, earthquake, uh, or the EPA deems this is a unclean um, site uh, that the tenant can no longer safely live in the premises. And then under those exceptional situations that the, the landlord can um, ask the tenants to leave. Otherwise, the, ten the landlord may not evict the tenant uh, because of that. Now, also in tenants issues uh, regarding late fees. Late fees is another uh, uh, problem uh, because your three day notice to pay rent or quit cannot include late fee. If you include any late fees, uh, it will be procedurally uh, get defeated. Uh, when it comes to a uh, trial, the judge will summarily dismiss the case without considering its merit, just because your uh, three-day notice is 
defective. It's called defective notice if it includes the late fee. Okay, so to circumvent the late fee situation and to circumvent the AB 1482 maximum uh, rent increase limits, I structure this. If the rent is 1950, let's say you put in MLS uh, property for lease, the rent for three bedroom, two bath is 1950. But when it comes to signing a contractual agreement, the lease agreement, I structure my contractual rent to be something different. 2150. Can I do that? It's different than the advertisement? Yeah. Because parole evidence rule, again, if two parties, tenant and landlord, willingly, not under duress, enter into a written agreement, parole, parole evidence rule says any other thing outside, including advertisements, cannot be admitted as evidence, cannot be contra controvertible evidence. Okay, so here you go. I structure my rent as 2150, 200 bucks more. But listen to this tenant agrees to pay 2150 per month as rent payable on the first of each month for the terms of this agreement. And plus any rent increases of any extensions thereof. The key part is the following landlord to credit tenant. $200 each month should rent be paid on or before the first of each month. So the tenant actually pays the same thing, but if you have this clause in there that says, landlord to credit tenant, certain amount of dollars each month, if the rent is paid on time, on or before the first of each month, this particular mechanism or this clause will eliminate your, land in, your, your rent in, uh, increase issue or your late fee issue. If the tenant does not pay rent on the first, okay, or before the first, the rent is already $200 more. Even if that $200 exceeds the 1482 limit, okay? So even if that exceeds a reasonable amount charged for late fee, late fee is normally 6%, it could be up to 10%. But a, a particular jurisdiction might find a 10% too draconian and might strike it down, make you refund all the, all the late fees. So to avoid the late fee issue and the uh, rent, rent uh, uh, amount issue, I uh, use this particular clause and I found very useful. I incorporate it into my own lease agreement and I, I, I use this in every single uh, 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 leases, uh, either my own property or uh, the property that I manage. Okay, now. Another section, unauthorized occupant. How often does that happen that a rental property have tenants or occupants that are not authorized, not on the rental agreement and not in the uh, rental application? Happens all the time. How do you deal with that? I have a case in Murray Park, my mother-in-law's house, a three bedroom, two bath condo in Murray Park. <coughs> the tenant um, have a... Uh, 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 at least one or two extra uh, occupants in there, okay? And, at the, and they also have pets. Uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not allowed pets. Uh, the, the lease agreement prohibits pets. So at the land, end of their term, I think it's like two or three years, uh, the tenant gave um, insufficient notice to the K also. So, but she wanted the whole deposit back. And then uh, she got an attorney to send me a letter, a very threatening letter, okay? and uh, uh, want the whole deposit back. I, I say, no, you're not entitled to whole deposit. One, you didn't give sufficient uh, notice. Tenant per contractual agreement must give landlord a 30 day written notice to vacate. Uh, she give much less than uh, uh, 15 days. So therefore um, the security deposit is gonna be deducted from the, uh, uh, for the number of days uh, that is not properly uh, given uh, as a notice to vacate. Uh, in addition, uh, they have pets in there uh, that have damaged certain parts of the property. Uh, they also left the property in a, uh, in a unclean and filthy condition. So um, the, the uh, tenant sue, uh, except the tenant sue in a small claims jurisdiction. Uh, I have a feeling that particular attorney is a friend of the family rather than a, uh, an attorney that the tenant uh, have paid money to retain. So. After going back and forth with attorney, uh, the, tenant, the, the attorney threatened me 
uh, that uh, do not contact the tenant. Um, and then I told him, well, as a property manager, I have every, every right to uh, contact the tenant. But when I'm represented by counsel myself, you will be prohibited from contacting me instead. So at the end, um, they, they sue the uh, owner uh, in small claim court. Uh, I show up and then I counterclaim uh, the uh, tenant. I sue the tenant back on behalf of the landlord. Uh, the tenant is claiming a certain amount of deposit. I think it's 1500 uh, uh, bucks. But we are, uh, I was suing the uh, uh, tenant uh, several thousand dollars more. Okay, how? Based on what? Okay, based on this particular clause I've in here. Okay, an authorized occupant. It's a tenant agrees to pay landlord an additional sum of, let's say $250 per month for each person not listed on this agreement, residing at the premises, and such set amount is calculated retroactively to the lease commencement date. That means you have an illegal tenant in there. That tenant's gonna cost you additional 250 bucks a month. From when? From the time you executed the lease agreement from the time the lease agreement commences. In the case that I mentioned, it was like three, three and a half years ago. The judge awarded the tenant, uh, I think three, $4,000 uh, in, uh, in damages, uh, but awarded my side up to $7,000 in damages because of that $250 per month. When I calculated by 12 months, there's $3,000 already, okay? Three and a half years, that's gonna be more than $10,000. But uh, the cap for small king jurisdiction is 10,000. But a judge, instead of giving us 10,000, he deducted certain um, items. So he gave us 7,000 something. But at the same time, they awarded the, the tenant um, three, $4,000. Uh, I, I don't think that was fair for, for the judge uh, to award them for that part. Uh, however, uh, th that was based on not returning security deposit. The non return of security deposit, uh, the landlord can be fined three times the amount. Okay. But in our case, with this particular clause in there, I was able to win a judgment um, far more than the tenant actually won. So uh, I find that uh, a helpful uh, clause. Okay, uh, regarding interior plumbing, what the, oh. Uh, Laura, uh, what do you think, should we, uh, <laughs> it's 12.15 already, I didn't know time goes by so fast. Yeah, I know it does. Um, we really don't have any questions. I'm, I have another webinar at one, so. Okay. I'm not sure how much longer you want to go. The main question seems to be, are your, your slides and stuff that you have here, are those going to be available to everybody? Um, uh, uh, basically, we're recording this, so and I'll put it up on the Tri-Counties website, um, okay. and then they can review it again there if they need to. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. I'm going to have to put in a disclaimer. Again, I'm not a licensed attorney. Uh, right. I don't want to be construed as practicing law. Okay. All these uh, provisions that I drafted is for my personal use, okay? And, uh, and uh, um, officially, I have to say I cannot give permission uh, to use uh, these clauses, okay? However, you get the uh, substance uh, of the clause and you can draft something very similar, uh, uh, having a same effect. Uh, the point is that you don't have to use word for word uh, for what I said. Um, so far, if, uh, whatever you draft is materially uh, uh, effective, um, that is good enough, okay? And um, just wanna give you guys some dates here. Um, Laura have asked me to do uh, several more of uh, these webinars. I have three more uh, webinars coming up in, uh, in May. Uh, May 7, same time, I always wanna do my class at 11 in the morning for one hour only. Uh, uh, May 7, that's a 1031 text deferred exchange. Um, uh, I, my regular class at, uh, in Walnut is from nine to, uh, nine to four, uh, even nine to four, a full day training is not sufficient to cover everything, but I try to go, uh, as fast as I can, uh, on the seven to cover the basics and the important part of the 1031, at least agents that are not experiencing and doing, uh, exchanges will get exposed to, uh, at least a fundamental uh, pack of uh, uh, 1031 exchanges. So when you converse with the client, uh, you were able to converse with the client more intelligently, okay? And on the 13th, 
uh, landlord tenant property management. Uh, that is always a fun one. And I will cover some of the items that I've covered today also uh, regarding a landlord tenant issue. Uh, for those of you guys uh, doing commercial properties or interest uh, in getting into commercial properties, uh, this will be a one hour uh, fundamental class to commercial properties uh, that will include the sales aspect and the leasing aspect of it. Uh, the leasing aspect of it is, is don't really discount that. Um, I, I always use this, this um, uh, scenario, uh, this, this, this case in my live class. Uh, a friend, I don't do leasing uh, uh, normally except for the property that I manage because it's so little commission and it's so much paperwork as you know. Um, uh, one lease transaction is same, almost the same amount of paperwork as a sales transaction, except you get a lot less money. Uh, 33 McAllister and Warner um, belong to a good friend of mine. Uh, the sister was in charge. Um, I uh, eventually uh, helped them and lease the property out and receive a less than $800 commission. Okay. And for lease, uh, for commercial lease, okay, it, its commission is a lot more. Uh, last, uh, 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 building, uh, building in San Marino, uh, San Bernardino, I lease it out. The rent is uh, $24,700 a month. Okay. And that's a quarter million dollars, uh, rent for the first year. Okay. If you get a, a, a commission on that, a quarter million dollar rent only for the first year, it's like selling a, a low price condo already. If that lease commercial lease agreement is a multi-year lease agreement, a five year lease agreement, that could be several million dollars uh, of the total lease amount. And even you get a 2% of it on two, $3 million, your lease commission would be like selling a single family home that's worth a couple million dollars. So um, look into uh, leasing also a lot, a lot less paperwork uh, for commercial leasing than a residential property sale. So you guys are interested in commercial property, getting into commercial property, um, get a, uh, get a, maybe get a little taste on the May 18th. Uh, uh, Trico do you offer a full day commercial training class uh, from nine to uh, five. Uh, those classes, uh, well, uh, check with Trico schedule because of coronavirus situation. Um, my uh, May, April, uh, March, April, May classes are all canceled. Uh, it depends how things gonna reopen. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll play by ear uh, for live classes. But uh, those are the three uh, coming up uh, uh, classes. May 7, 1031 exchange, May 13, landlord tenant, uh, and May 18, uh, commercial properties. Everybody have a fantastic afternoon and uh, have Honey, a I have a question afternoon. for you. There's yes. a question. Yes. As to the lease, what if one of the tenant wants to remove her name from the lease among the other four tenants month to month um, lease agreement and ask for her portion of the deposit back? <laughs> okay. Uh, if the lease have expired already and they're going month to month, a tenant can basically give the landlord um, notice to recate, a 60 day notice to recate, uh, or 30 day notice to recate. So uh, the security deposit. Now, in the call uh, uh, lease agreement, okay, um, in my, uh, I didn't cover uh, that uh, today. Uh, in my own lease agreement, there's a one particular clause that I have in the, in, under the security deposit section. It specifically uh, delineate how the security deposit will be refunded. And it's going to be refunded for one particular person or it's going to be split between the parties. Let's say boyfriend and girlfriend, okay? $2,000 rent, each of them uh, tend to $1,000. But the girlfriend gave the $1,000 cash to the boyfriend. The boyfriend gave a $2,000 cash to the, to the landlord. At the end of the day, when the tenant moves out, if they have a breakup or whatever, the tenant move out, who does the landlord refund the money to? If the landlord writes a check for both of their names, okay, if they don't have a joint account, they can't cash the check. And a single person cannot cash a, a check uh, when the check is made out to two people. So in this case, it really depends on the contractual agreement and uh, how, is it, how is it worded. Um, can the security deposit be proportionately uh, refund to a particular tenant? So. Uh, it, without knowing your lease agreement, it's, it's, it's hard to say. But I would think uh, if four people to a, uh, to a lease agreement, if one gives a notice, okay, and is it considered sufficient? Does the contract say it, it one person, in my, con my lease agreement, 
any person on the lease agreement give a notice will represent the rest of the parties. So um, I, I don't know about the particular con contractual agreement that that agent is referring to. So it, it could be a little tricky. Okay, I got one more question. If a selling agent sends a CVA along with an RPA and the seller would accept all terms in RPA but refuse to sign the CVA, do we have a binding contract based on RPA alone? Oh, good question. This is, this is so new and uh, I would think not because if the CVA is a part of the agreement, it's part of the addendum and if if not the whole terms of agreements are accepted, there will be no contract, in my opinion. Now, in, <clears throat> in contract to be legal and enforceable, there's certain uh, uh, number of elements in contract law. Okay, you have to have um, uh, uh, mutual assent, meaning a, a meeting of the mind, mutual agreement. It has to have consideration. Consideration is something of value to be exchanged uh, by, by the contractual parties. It has to have legal capacity. Okay, legal capacity not only just meaning um, 18 years or older, or, or that person has a mental capacity, and that person is not under duress. Yeah, okay? person under duress have no legal capacity. Okay, and uh, and these are the material elements of a contract. The meeting of the mind, if the offer constitutes an RPA and the CBA, and the CV have certain terms that are different than the RPA, or in not different, additional. Uh, terms to the RPA, and if the offer is not accepted in a in whole, that is no agreement, in my opinion. Does that make sense? I mean, I would the um, the seller can counter. Uh, if the counter is accepted, then the counter would become part of the agreement, but the original CBA would not. Okay. <laughs> Thank right. You. Very good. Everybody, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Okay, okay take care. So we'll see you again on May 7th. All right. All right. Okay. Bye, Tony. Thank you. Have a good day.